Thanks so much, Peter, and it's a real pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you for having me. I'm coming from Cape Town in South Africa, and Dr. Propa, and it's, it's long overdue that I've come to this meeting, but as the president of the International AIDS Society, I want to bring our, our good wishes to this region and assure you that not only do we care about this region, but we watch this region as an instructor for the rest of, of the world. And so just again, the fantastic stuff we're seeing I think is inspiring and needs to be taken uh, to, the, to the global world. Uh, your, the, the first two talks, the sense of urgency, I think is one that we really need to amplify across the world. This is our chance to make a difference, to turn the statistics down, downwards so that we actually do move towards um, epidemic control. And, and uh, there is no doubt in it here that it is going to be a combination of the, the dual cascade. So I'm, I'm going to launch into my talk, um, and I think it gels nicely with the two talks you've just heard. Um, and so I'll skip over quite a few of the slides because I think it really just serves to amplify uh, this message. So adolescent lives matter, of course. And I, want, I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll realize that by investing in this population, we really do invest for a triple dividend. R returns today, uh, in the near future, and of course in, in the future as these young people move into adulthood as healthy, uh, HIV-free or HIV-controlled uh, people moving into adulthood. So the world is getting younger. About a half of the global population is now under 30 years old. And certainly we do need to know that there is a coming youth bulge, and particularly in my region, uh, we will see that one in every four youth will live in Africa in the next 20 years. So this is really a time when our focus needs to turn to those people who uh, fulfill this mysterious age of the second decade moving into the third decade. Uh, we should also know that 90% of young people live in developing countries, so it is very much a problem of our uh, regions. The global health profile of 10 to 24 year olds also can be divided up into um, NCD predominant, injury excess, and multi-burden, and you see those purple countries uh, where multi-burden uh, is really uh, predominant, with two-thirds of, of uh, disability adjusted life years in adolescence coming from these adolescents in multi-burden countries. And of course, unsafe sex is a cause of those dallies in the 15 to 24 year olds. The estimated top five causes of adolescent death uh, in the World Health Organization region is shown in this slide. And again, you see youth in Africa are worst off mainly due to a high prevalence of communicable diseases in HIV and AIDS. Uh, and you see the importance of um, violence or, or non-fatal uh, uh, injuries playing a role in this region, so something else to be thinking about. Most of the uh, causes of death in this age group are, of course, preventable. Here are the, uh, the, the data on the estimated five causes of adolescent disability-adjusted life years again in the, in the Hugh region, and um, no surprise that communicable diseases, including HIV, playing a significant role in sub-Saharan Africa. It is important, though, to note this goes beyond just uh, mortality and morbidity. It's also about well-being and health in general. And it's disturbing to note that 85% of youth globally actually experience only low or moderate to low well-being. And this comes from a thing called the Global Youth Wellbeing Index. It was launched in 2014, now a second report in 2016. And I point out to you where South Africa is and where Thailand, the other countries are small. I encourage you to go and read the report. It's not long, uh, but it's sobering in terms of how we are letting our young people in the world down. Um, and, and I've lifted out the seven domains that are covered um, and you can see how Thailand scored out of 30 countries and how South Africa uh, runs alongside Thailand. Um, and you see their health, both of us uh, needing to do some work, safety and security, certainly. South Africa wins on citizen participation. So I think that's how we, we tend to edge past Thailand uh, because otherwise um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in just about all the domains. 
So young lives are riddled with risk, diseases of poverty, injuries, non-communicable diseases all playing a significant role. And I single out mental health in, in the non-communicable diseases and substance use disorder. It was said some years ago now that adolescence is a time of life that harbors many risks and dangers, but also one that pre presents great opportunities for sustained health and well-being. And this is where the triple dividend comes in. I'm hoping that by the end of this, you'll all feel very enthusiastic about going home to figure out where uh, you can be doing more for adolescent health and well-being. We know the youth vulnerabilities fall into biological, behavioral, structural, social, and psychological. Um, and if this population is educated, empowered, engaged, they can become the agents of change, shaping our world for the better. But the alternative is also true. If they're unemployed, they have no opportunities, they're underserviced, they're ignored, they become disaffected, angry, and become uh, you know, a force in, in a different direction. So let's try to explore some of these youth vulnerabilities, and I will have a sub-Saharan African lens, uh, particularly with young women in mind, simply because that is where I come from. But across the board, adolescence is a developmental transition, biological, structural, behavioral vulnerabilities, which result in a greater risk-taking, a present bias, poor knowledge and application of knowledge, these behavioral aspects we know well, as well as structural things such as finding prejudicial and inadequate health services and a lack of privacy. And this journey really is unique, but I want to pick out uh, an important factor for all of you, that there is a physiological reason for why adolescents behave the way they do. And certainly this brain modeling is very important to understand. The brain is under development in adolescents. There's early maturation of the limbic system. This uh, starts at about age 10 to 12 and results in all of these very characteristic adolescent um, uh, attributes. It is only later when the executive function, which is in the prefrontal cortex, begins to organize itself. And this modeling is very actively underway in, in adolescence. So now we start to see organization, weighing risks, etc., but only coming in really in, in the third decade. Um, and finally, everything coming together with increased connections between the prefrontal frontal cortex and the subcortical areas, eventually resulting in what we hope is a stable and organized adult brain. I hope that all helps you to understand better the adolescence that might actually be in your household or that you've managed to get into adulthood uh, in your household or those of you actually grappling with this stage in your lives at the moment. There is a fantastic book that I think you should look out for. It's coming out in April. Uh, it's been written by Sarah Jane Blakemore and really gets into, into the, the nitty gritty of this and important uh, to, to recognize. But youth have been through us, been with us throughout the ages. We know this is a time when there's more alcohols, there's experimentation with substances, foster driving, bungee jumping, and of course experimentation with sex. This is the time when young people start to understand their sexual lives and their sexual beings. Not to uh, forget, though, that it is a time when other factors, such as, for example, youth road fatalities, and I was struck that although Thailand has made some, um, some headway here, it still stands out way above norm in terms of youth road fatality. So one very uh, um, tangible area to work on. But moving back to sexual risk behavior, Risk behaviors are those behaviors that are associated with a negative or unintended health outcome. And of course, HIV uh, in the last 30 years has been very much in our minds, but STIs have been here for a very long time, and of course, unintended pregnancy. So AIDS is still the number one cause of death of adolescents in Africa, second leading cause of adolescent death worldwide. Um, and of course, 85% of young people living with HIV reside in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so you see the, the regions where most of the mortality is occurring very much centered in Eastern and Southern Africa. 28,000 people uh, who are young 
were newly infected in sub-Saharan Africa in this week alone. 2,000 were young women in this week alone in my country, South Africa. We must feel the urgency when we hear these numbers. We are nowhere near the end of AIDS when we hear these numbers. It is really important that we leave here. I always say to people when I give these talks, why are we standing and talking in these meetings? We should be at home making a difference to these numbers, but I'm hoping uh, that you, you will feel uh, the sense of urgency. In Sub-Saharan Africa, young women are our key population, and you can see here that it has now been phylogenetically shown in terms of viral studies uh, that young women are having their initial sexual uh, activity with men slightly older than themselves, five to six years older. Those men typically are uh, difficult to test, link and suppress. They're invisible in services which are ill-designed for them. And so this young woman who may be unemployed, she uh, experiences gender-based violences, she may have limited agency, services are not ideal for her. Uh, she may be exposed, and we now know that hormonal contraception may in fact be playing a role, that she uh, becomes infected at a, at a young age. She then, as she matures, uh, develops these uh, serodiscordant or serodifferent uh, a relationship where now the young man becomes exposed to HIV. And so this HIV vicious cycle continues, well described in, in Durban in 2016, and now helping us to really figure out how we tackle our vicious cycle in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa to make a difference to that young woman. But HIV remains a global issue when it comes to prevention among adolescents. Almost 32% of new HIV infections occur in adolescents outside of sub-Saharan Africa. And already you've heard about young key populations, and it's very important that we think about the youth in each of these key populations. We know that their risk is inordinately higher than the rest of the general population, and it's because they are more likely to have unprotected sex STIs including HIV, unintended pregnancy and violence, mental health disorders, um, and they also experience greater barriers to accessing care, low coverage of services, and more stigma and discrimination. So I constructed my own sense of perhaps the cycle uh, that is happening amongst young key populations uh, throughout the world. And it's clear that unless we reach uh, these populations for treatment as well as with prevention, we are not going to stop the epidemic. So let's turn to some of the biological risk factors. And we know that in our part of the world, there are high rates of unplanned teenage pregnancy, high rates of non-consensual sex, asymptomatic STIs. We're seeing a huge amount of untreated asymptomatic STIs in this era of, um, of being able to test STIs with uh, gene expert and other point of care testing, inconsistent use of hormonal contraception, inconsistent condom use, and of course, under use of health facilities. So here's STIs, uh, two examples from our own clinic. MSM uh, rates uh, in a, a PrEP study that we, we ran just recently, and rates of STIs in young women up to 40% of 17-year-olds having asymptomatic chlamydia trachoma, 10% gonorrhea. So long before PrEP even hit the scene, as Nitya mentioned, we had a lot of STIs. What about the behavioral risk factors? Well, we know sex is, is, the, is the sort of debut for young people uh, in adolescence. And uh, in, in my country, sexual debut is round about 15 years old. Uh, we know that young marriage is another factor in sub-Saharan Africa, with one in three girls married uh, under the age of 18. And early marriage influences sexual behavior and results in early sex. So again, these are uh, the factors that lead to young women being particularly at risk for HIV. Alcohol, substances, and of course HIV risk, well described, well understood, and I know uh, a global problem. And mental health, something that is just not uh, 
you know, catered for sufficiently. And amongst young people, this really is their key NCD. This is a, a problem that needs lots of attention. In my country, huge amounts of post-traumatic stress disorder amongst young people. And here, you see in Russia, amongst young people, self-harm fatalities just way above uh, the index average. So again, uh, areas where we can turn our attention. We know that there are structural and social um, areas where we can work as well. Here are South African adolescents who find themselves largely unemployed. They've been born into democracy. They have only ever known HIV. Unemployment is really their biggest priority. Many of them urbanizing. We expect 80% of South Africa's youth to find themselves in these shanty towns by the end of this decade because they search work. And you can see 70% of our under 24 year olds are unemployed and more than f uh, most of them have not ever been employed, what we call never employed and having given up. So they're nihilistic, they're not even looking for employment anymore. And yet we know that it's only those who find themselves uh, in tertiary education who have any hope of getting any kind of, uh, any kind of employment. Lack of education and employment opportunities really drives HIV. Education is protective. Poverty drives young women out of school uh, and results in, in um, transactional sex and sex work for many. So we are looking to alternatives such as cash and care programs to say, can we rescue these young women by providing social protection as well as chemical protection as Nitya described a moment ago. Poverty shapes risk and access to service, so young people who find themselves in poverty-stricken areas also have poor access and poor health outcomes as a result. The barriers in access to sexual and reproductive health services also are held back by conflicting laws, um, ages of consent, limited knowledge, stigma and discrimination, and of course, low uptake of prevention services. So it's no surprise that the first 90, we haven't even got out of the doors uh, in sub-Saharan Africa with only 13% of young women uh, being tested and 9% of their male counterparts. So no surprise that alongside this is this huge increasing bulge of young people also living with HIV. And of course, here we need to turn our attention to better care uh, and better management. So we know we have two adolescent populations, those who have grown up with HIV, who were perinatally infected, and those who have acquired the HIV uh, behaviorally. And it's important that we embrace both of those populations, recognizing that this is the age when young people really struggle with adherence to programs and adherence to treatment. And it's not just HIV. So again, this region has led the way, but I encourage you all to be thinking about how we will transition these young adolescents from adolescence into adult care in a way that they are uh, healthy and uh, HIV controlled. And I draw your attention to this series of papers that uh, made their way in 2017 all about healthcare transition. The organization at IAS called CIFA has come up with some very key research areas to improve access and uptake of HIV testing, to improve linkage, access and uptake of HIV testing in key populations, consent policies and practices, and of course self-testing, no surprises there. What do they recommend are research areas for treatment? Well, adherence, uh, novel drug delivery systems. You heard about the cabotegravir, um, long acting. Uh, Co-infections are very important. Sequencing of art um, and of course, short and long-term outcomes, particularly as regards those people who've lived long with HIV and been on antiretrovirals for a long time. And then we would really ask you also to think about how we provide care and service. How do we retain young people? What about combining sexual and reproductive outcomes? What about pregnant adolescents? And what are our service delivery models? We need differentiated service delivery models specific for adult, uh, adolescents. And um, of course, not uh, least, but psychosocial and mental health support 
as well. So how are we going to reach these adolescents? What do they want? How do we engage them? And where do we engage them? We know there are an enormous number of barriers to services that are individual due to our healthcare problems, healthcare systems, and other structural barriers such as legal consent issues, criminalization, and others. So I do want to introduce this concept of differentiated service delivery specific for youth and adolescent care. You have to know your population and you need to tailor your response appropriately. So who exactly are we talking about? Well, also known as Generation Z or the I generation, they are the adolescents born uh, after 1994. They expect instant communication. It's a basic right. It's not something that is exciting anymore. It's just the normal way of living. They expect transparency. They expect to be part of the discussion. They, it's expected. It's not a, you know, sort of something that you, you bestow upon them. This is an expectation. They expect their voices to be heard. Uh, they very much into web-based self-learning approaches. No longer do you, they wait for parental instruction. YouTube has all the answers. Google has all the answers. They don't need the adults in their lives anymore, they think. Um, and certainly, they have perfected self-learning approaches. They're comfortable within a diverse society, and they want gender equality, and they expect innovation and solutions to today's problems. So they, they, they go beyond, and they've told us many times, they need tailored services that are adolescent responsive. They need flexibility. So the evening clinics, really very important. Comprehensive services that are a one-stop shop. Fragmented health care is something that an adolescent just cannot wrap their heads around. So the model I'd like to put to each of you takes in a psychosocial a socio-ecological framework. These kids do not exist without us as adults, as their peers, as their social networks. So by no means am I saying take family out of the equation. We have to think of this adolescent encased within a socio-ecological framework. But then we approach it with the double helix cascade. So it doesn't, the adolescence, the important thing here, and what I would really encourage and what we've tried to adopt is a zero neutral approach. It doesn't matter whether they're positive or negative, diseased, non-diseased, pregnant, not pregnant. They come to our service as a central figure. And then we wrap our services around them. That is adolescent-centered, adolescent-friendly, adolescent-driven, and community-based. So here you go. Uh, you find them sharing experiences, sharing venues. This is a good place uh, to find them. Bundle the age and the venue-specific interventions in community-based community partnerships. So how will we engage them? Well, too often we medicalize this. We talk about if you don't do this, you'll get AIDS and die. If you don't do this, you'll get an STI and your penis will drop off. Whatever the situation, it's, it's a medicalized sort of approach. Whereas what I would really encourage is that we come in a game frame where we look for a certain outcome and we are more persuasive with our game framing. Uh, approaches. So we went to our young people and we said, how would you like to see PrEP portrayed? They said, we want to take control of our sexuality and we want to be part of this movement to end AIDS. And so we constructed uh, this, uh, this um, uh, concept of being part of a movement. So I'll ask you to just watch this. I'm prepared for life's twists and turns.
itu cegel dulu tuh konflik jadi cekrok ini deh tuh harus selesai eh pak bintang ini ada nomor projek ini ada di sini aku selesai aku terima kasih kita harus berjuang untuk kuat untuk membuat negara ini jadi I use it for this hour to be the people So PrEP advertising really needs to move us out of this medicalized model. We need to normalize behavior whilst reducing risk. I ask you, are they more likely to go with the, the concept on the right or the concept on the left? And it really is a no-brainer. Um, and so we, I, I'm hoping what I'm uh, really putting forth to you is the need for a tailored approach which takes into consideration consideration behavioral, structural, biomedical, that encompasses a very much a, uh, an all-encompassing uh, combination package, regardless of which young population we're thinking about. Uh, that we consider other innovative means, such as social protection, care, education, and we bring this together in an accessible, layered, integrated approach. Um, that really can be adapted to anywhere in the world. So what I'm talking about is harm reduction. We recognize young people face risks. They're having risks in their lives every day. Our job is to reduce those risks by whichever way we can think. And by doing that, we can begin to say, what are my responses to every part in this vicious cycle to reduce the risk uh, that they may be encountering? Where should we be engaging them? Well, we've already heard that there, there can be some really innovative ways uh, to engage young people. Again, the top is a real turn off. How do we get to the left? But I would say the most important ingredient of young person engagement is relationships. Relationships with you, with their peers, with trusted adults, support, accessibility, ease of use, tailored, choice, fun, reduce stigma or bad feeling, judgmental, and again framing messaging. All of the above uh, is absolutely key. We've uh, tried to encompass this in a variety of different ways. I'll be telling uh, the team at, at Thai Red Cross tomorrow about some of the things we've done, taken the services in mobiles, added PrEP. We now give out PrEP from our mobiles. We're now giving PrEP uh, online and providing the PrEP on bicycles to people in township homes with uh, self-testing associated. So ladies and gentlemen, we can cash in on these amazing evolving capabilities. Remember, children started on art, have grown into adolescence with complex treatment histories and limited ARV options. We've got to keep our treatment hats on, okay? Adolescents currently have poor access to appropriate services with high losses to follow up, poor adherence, increased risk of HIV, HIV resistance, and other conditions. The implementation of zero-neutral adolescent-friendly services is critical, but in itself not enough. We have to go beyond our services. We need comprehensive primary and secondary prevention. Consciously transitioning these adolescents and of course, including nothing about us without us, including adolescents in the development and testing of these new strategies and, and uh, innovations. So what is your to-do list? Here's mine. I would, uh, I would happily share it with you. I must know my adolescent community and formulate my response appropriately. I need to ensure different and complementary platforms for different segments of the adolescents to improve engagement. Don't forget early adolescents. We're all anxious about the 10 to 14 year olds. They are adolescent and we often leave them out of our programming. 10 to 14 year olds are beginning to formulate their sexual identity. It's a great time to really uh, move in and, and, and claim that evolving capacity. Adopt harm reduction approaches uh, comprehensive sexuality education needs revitalization, something we spoke about in the 80s. We will bring it back. Amsterdam, we have a plenary on this. We're going to be talking about this in a big way, and I hope you'll all be there. Conduct implementation research, very important, and Cypher has given you some areas. 
Adolescents living with HIV require long-term expert treatment and support, I've already said that, and think about the sustainable development goals. These are important entry points, HIV and SRH, into a broader adolescent health and, uh, health and well-being um, approach. So here you see this all coming together in that way. I'll skip this slide in the interests of time, but these are just some of the things we're trying to do uh, to meet that need. So beyond 1990 to the triple dividend, innovation, move out of facilities, engage, integrate, and tailor. And think adolescent. So that'll be the last thing I, I want to say to you before reminding you that Peter and I will welcome you to Amsterdam uh, in July this year. I'm really hoping you'll be looking out. The, the uh, scholarships have been extended. Please go online, make sure you've applied for your scholarship, um, and there will also be opportunities for youth ambassadors, so be watching out for that as well. And I thank everyone who's helped me to put this talk together, particularly the young people and their families. <laughs>